What is up, history people? I'm here once again. This is the recording number two of the day, actually, to talk about the rise of conservatism, uh, Reagan's um, domestic policies, and in particular, uh, Reaganomics, wearing the Yankee hat, because my hair is getting a little bit out of control. See, it's getting some some point I'm not even going to be able to gel it anymore. Um, also, you might hear Carrie Schmitz Carly um, ripping up carpet in the next room, so... Pay no mind. Anywho, um, let's get going. So uh, the big question that I usually ask about this is in, in the 1980s, you see this political shift from like the epitome of liberal policy in the United States, these like liberal ideas that come about to a shift to conservative values, which actually permeate um, throughout the 80s, the 90s, the 2000s, and you could and even today. Um, the U.S. has never really gone back to um, the liberalism that it experienced in the 60s and 70s. So let's talk a little bit about that and make sure that we hit on how society was liberal after World War II, as some of those examples are. Um, and I'll get to that in a little bit. Um, however, probably the number one thing on everybody's mind that leads to the rise of conservatism and the presidency of Ronald Reagan and his domestic policies is the economy in the 1970s. This is a picture of gas lines and gas rationing. Um, so if you watch the end of the uh, Cold War video, I talked a little bit about how the importance of oil, especially oil from the Middle East that was coming in. Um, during the 1970s, Israel fought a war. Um, against uh, a number of Middle Eastern countries called the y Yom Kippur War. Um, and the U.S. supported Israel in that venture. And as a result, Iran and, and a few other Middle Eastern oil companies in OPEC, um, well, not OPEC, sorry, it's, it's a little bit, it's like a subsidiary of OPEC, which is only the Middle Eastern um, Arabian Peninsula countries in OPEC. And if you're not familiar, OPEC is a um, oil uh, cartel that determines the price of oil, they pretty much cut oil um, exports to the United States and drove up the price of oil. It was very hard to get gasoline. Um, and also you had a period of inflation or really highly rising prices. And when combined with the rising prices and the lack of oil, the economy kind of stagnated and you had this period of stagflation, which is where you have high inflation and high unemployment or a uh, recession in your economy, which was something that up until this point, uh, based on economic theory, couldn't actually exist. So people didn't really know what to do about it. So the 1970s economy is doing very, very poorly, um, in part because of the oil. And there's a couple other reasons. It wasn't just oil. Um, the U.S. had spent a ton of money fighting the Cold War in a variety of different places, especially Vietnam. You also had a high increase in social spending during that time as well. And then the 70s are kind of when uh, globalism really starts to, to, to begin. And a lot of the manufacturing jobs that were done in America start to, start to, it didn't really hit its peak until later, but start to get shifted overseas. And the U.S. starts to become more of a, a service economy. And when you're not producing things, it's a little bit difficult to um, kind of argue for rising wages. Um, so, so a number of reasons that this inflation was happening, but the big one that people focus on is, is the lack of oil in the economy. Um, and here's, I actually found this, pulled this up. You can see the price of a barrel of crude, it's supposed to say crude oil, barrel of crude oil um, over time. But we're talking about kind of this time period right between here and here where you can see it kind of hit its peak um, right as the 1980s come around. So this is on everybody's mind, um, how it's causing these prices to rise and also the economy is stagnate. Um, usually, so you see this uh, shaded portion right here. Usually when you have a recession, which is what the shaded portions are, you will see um, prices come down, but you actually see oil being pretty high. It does come down, but it's still pretty high, which is what leads to that inflation during a recession. Um, as you can see here, uh, I lived through this. I mean, you did too, but I, I don't know how well you remember it. Um, but this is when you had the start of the Great Recession in like 2008, 2009, and oil was super expensive and gas was super expensive. And then the bottom of it just fell out and you can see it came all the way down. Um, and then you even got right now where with COVID-19, people are not demanding oil. There was already kind of a glut of oil. And now um, the oil prices is, is falling even further. 
Um, so anyway, what we're focusing on is right here where this time period where oil was spiked quite a bit um, and caused a lot of ripple effects in the economy. So if you're not familiar, you don't remember from government class, what is a conservative? I'm going to go over with the broad strokes once again, uh, what it means to be conservative politically in terms of the economy and in social issues. This is Barry Goldwater. He's usually considered like the OG conservative uh, to run for the Republican nomination for president in 1964. He got shellacked by Lyndon B. Johnson, but many of his um, principles remained and started to gain popularity throughout the 60s and 70s. Um, Ronald Reagan for uh, Barry Goldwater's campaign gave a speech that's titled A Time for Choosing, which is one of his most famous speeches where he lays out pretty much what is even today the Republican agenda or the conservative agenda um, for, for economics and, and society, but mostly economics. You can check that out if you want. There's a clip. You can just Google a time for choosing Ronald Reagan. They'll show up on YouTube. Um, but generally, a conservative is the opposite of a liberal. liberal. So in terms of economics, a conservative generally would want to have less government involvement in the economy, which usually means lower taxes, less government regulation of the economy, um, less government um, employment. So the government, you know, letting private industry do the things in the economy as opposed to the government, you know, building roads and bridges and, and providing universities and hospitals and things like that. Um, also, usually on the social side of things, social issues, they would tend to like more social control or or sometimes you see it uh, referred to as like a maintenance of traditional values. So kind of like, I don't know, keeping up with uh, what people would normally see are beneficial in society, um, socially, not looking for a ton of change in society, as it were. And it tends to be grounded in religious views, though not always. There's conservatives that aren't necessarily uh, religious, but you tend to see that a lot um, in the conservative um, political realms, um, having a ground or some type of religious values. So here's some things that conservatives tend to, and I always stress tend to believe in because not everybody's the same. Don't let anyone push you in a box. It's dangerous. So usually lower taxes in general, uh, less government spending on social programs. So things like uh, public health insurance, um, financial aid, uh, welfare payments, um, food stamps to an extent or, or, or SNAP benefits as we call them today. Um, strong national defense, so really like to put money into the national defense. Um, you can see even today, uh, the, the, the Trump budgets, um, Republican president, the last four years have had some of the highest defense spending um, budgets um, that we've had in, in many years. Um, supply side economics, at least since President Reagan, which we'll talk about later if you're not familiar, supply side economics, and then traditional cultural values in terms of family, sexuality, gun control, abortion, um, Etc. So what, what, what was traditional in society, they want to tend to maintain. And then the last thing that I always just try to tell you whenever I talk about these things is that conservatives is not necessarily equal Republican. Republicans are a political party who tend to have conservative ideologies, but it's a continuum. You have Democrats who lean a little bit more conservative than other Democrats. You have Republicans that are liberal on some, more liberal on some issues. Over time, especially in your all's lifetimes, in my lifetime, You've seen that kind of split quite a bit, so it is kind of a little more black and white per se uh, in terms of liberal versus conservative, Republican versus Democrat, um, but it's not always like that. Okay, so let's talk about Ronald Reagan. If you're not familiar with Ronald Reagan, um, he's a lot of people's favorite president. He's a lot of people's least favorite president, depending usually on what political ideology you are. Um, but he was a former actor. He was also former president of the Actors Union, the Screen Actors Guild. He used to be a Democrat. He was a witness against communism in Hollywood back when they had things like the Loyal, the HUAC, the House Un-American Activities Committee during the, the, the New Red Scare um, in the Hollywood 10. And he was a Republican governor of California. So some people mistakenly think that he just went straight from being an actor to being president of the United States. That's not true. He had a political career and he was also a governor of a major state. Um, and he was elected in 1980 over President Carter, who was an incumbent president, much maligned um, based on what was happening foreign policy-wise and the economy at that time. Uh, and one of his big, like, signature domestic policies, not President Carter, President Reagan, was the Economic Recovery Act of 1981. It was a series of tax cuts on a variety of things. So the first one was income taxes. So it brought the, the, the 
income tax rate down, um, especially in that top bracket. The top bracket of income taxes, top marginal rate used to be like 78%. He brought it down to, I think, 35. Um, it's a little bit higher today uh, than 35, but nowhere near how high it was when he took office. Um, he brought down um, taxes about 25% on average. Um, capital gains, which is money you make on the sale of assets like real estate or mostly stocks. So it took down those prices or those tax rates. Corporate income, so the corporate tax rate, gift and inheritance tax. And then uh, the greatest cut overall would come to top income bra brackets. And this goes back to uh, what I talked about before, this idea of supply side economics. And the idea behind supply side economics, just really quickly, is that you focus your economic stimulus on what is perceived to be the group or groups of people in society that are producing and employing people. So generally, the theory was is that if you cut taxes on wealthy people, it will, quote unquote, trickle down to the rest of society because they will start businesses, expand businesses, employ more people, produce more. Um, and that's another reason for the corporate income tax breaks as well. So that's just a really, in a nutshell, supply side economics. Also, if you want, um, there's a link to his inaugural address. I'll put the slides and teams for you if you want to see it. He just talks about, I mean, really just textbook conservatism as we know it today. He talks about like government getting out of the way and letting the economy flourish and things like that. So why, like, this idea of conservatism is that the government should be limited so that individuals and businesses can pursue their own solutions to solve problems. So here are some of the like categories of like what was liberal during the 1960s and 70s and then like what conservatives conservatives pushed back against as we go up and this didn't happen over like overnight but as we move from the 70s into the 80s why are people becoming like more conservative overall. So here are a couple examples. So in terms of uh the federal government. So a lot of people saw that the, the federal government had been growing astronomically over time. And a lot of people believe that this was making the government become too big, too involved in people's lives and corrupt in general, corrupt institutions. So you have things like the New Deal, going back to the Great Depression. You have the Great Society programs under Lyndon B. Johnson, which vastly expanded social programs, um, not just civil rights, but for the environment, for education, uh, for uh, low income people, for senior citizens, uh, Medicare, major great society program. And then you had some political um, scandals as well. You had the Watergate scandal with Richard Nixon. And then you had a lot of, um, a lot of uh, cases, the church committee, sorry, I'm, I don't know how I'm talking right now. 1975, the church committee was set up to investigate FBI abuses, and they found that the FBI had been abusing people's civil liberties and civil rights in the name of fighting communism, uh, fighting against civil rights leaders, Martin Luther King, a um, variety of other African-American groups. Um, so again, this, this idea that the FBI can possibly be corrupt is not anything new uh, by any means. So people were kind of losing faith in the federal government to be able to solve problems, and they thought that it was getting too big. Um, foreign policy failures. So one big thing was Vietnam. Uh, Vietnam was fresh in people's memories. People thought that it made the U.S. look weak, that the U.S. had like finally lost a war. Um, and then also at this time, like I talked about in the end of the um, Cold War video, you had uh, the Iranian hostage crisis and, you know, um, OPEC cutting oil exports to the U.S. and people felt like the U.S. was losing its stance as a global leader in the world. Uh, political realignment, you had the Dixiecrats or the Southern Democrats start to shift over and become Republican. So the Southern part of the country goes from being always Democrat to now voting Republican, uh, which brings a lot of those conservative values into um, the Republican Party. They already, they did exist before that, but, but even more so now. Um, Nixon had a strategy in 1968 that they called the Southern Strategy, which was to try to win over the Southern states uh, for the Republican Party and shift them, flip them, if you will, from blue to red. Um, economic challenges. So you have the idea, the idea of supply side economics, that this could help the economy. Um, stagflation, like I already talked about, you had high inflation and a stagnant economy was causing a lot of problems and the oil crisis that was was one of the major causes, but still going on. People couldn't get gasoline. Um, interest rates started to rise because they were trying to solve this issue of inflation. So it was very hard to get loans and mortgages and things like that. Um, there's this uh, reaction socially to the expanding civil and political rights that people felt was kind of like changing society in a way that maybe people weren't ready for it to change or 
the way that it was changing was you know going against traditional values not so much not so much african americans there was some pushback against you know some of the riots and like groups like the black panthers and the black power movement but for the most part people were pretty on board with african americans gaining civil rights during that time but you did have um groups like american indian movement which people were upset about um the lgbtq plus movement environmental movement so a lot of these movements that were trying to progress being very progressive or liberally minded people were starting to push back against and think that they're harmful for society uh you have things like title nine and the battle over the equal rights amendment um there is a variety of supreme court cases that were seen as like very liberal in the 1960s in terms of expanding rights to various groups of people um so like rights for people accused of crimes with miranda v arizona so where your miranda rights come from affirmative action was declared to be okay as long as you weren't strictly um having racial quotas in baki v california and then the big one probably the biggest was the supreme court decision in roe v wade in 1973 which determined that um abortion was covered as a constitutional right of privacy under the the fourth uh fifth and 14th amendment and could not be made illegal um or could not provide a, could not put an undue burden is what they said an undue burden on um women seeking abortion and that was a huge that kind of fits into what we see down here which is a sense of moral decay that a lot of conservatives felt at the time so this idea of moral decay or kind of like society changing from what it had been before so you had a lot more women going in the workforce you had changing family structures you had um a lot more divorce rising divorce rates you had uh single parent households uh blended families um so just changing the traditional way that the family had been structured for a long time and then the counterculture movement during vietnam 60s and 70s um really making people feel like society was kind of morally losing its way and i would make an argument that like every like generation feels that way about the generation that comes after it but it was like particularly strong during this time of social upheaval upheaval sorry uh this is some charts you can go and look at these at your leisure but it just shows like birth rates um particularly to teenagers so you can see from like 1950 to 1980 or uh, not really but during the 60s and 70s really you had the birth rate for teenage mothers really rising um as you move into the 70s also unmarried women the birth rate for unmarried women uh was steadily increasing all the way up until to, well actually since about 2008 or so it's actually come down but this was something that people were worried about then marriage and divorce um so you got marriages new marriages kind of falling um during starting kind of in the late 60s early 70s and then divorces rising um during that time uh so making people feel like they you know society was kind of losing its way so to speak. um here's some other uh reagan measures so other than just the tax cuts he did cut a lot of spending on social programs did highly increase spending on defense which i did talk about in the other video for the cold war but he cut about 40 billion dollars in domestic programs such as food stamps student loans public transportation other public works uh vastly increased spending on military and defense he did not cut medicare or social security which were two very important entitlement programs that nobody ever wants to touch because senior citizens vote in record numbers like way more than any other group so you don't want to make them upset so he didn't cut any of those programs uh deregulated businesses quite a bit so for example restrictions on like banking institutions savings and loan institutions which are a little bit different but what they could invest in the type of loans they could give out so deregulating that um deals between corporations so kind of getting the government out of like um trust enforcement um and what types of dealings corporations were into with their shareholders um things of that nature um environmental protection which i have a whole nother like article you can read from 1989 about reagan's um environmental policy and then he opened a lot of land for coal, coal and timber production especially up in montana up there um for for fossil fuels uh he also took a strong stance against labor unions and argued that they were well he didn't maybe call it argue but he took a strong stance especially when a bunch of air traffic controllers in the early 1980s went on strike and wanted higher pay he came in because technically the federal government was the air traffic controllers um employer and he told them that if they didn't report to work that he would fire them and a bunch of them did not report to work so he fired all of them and that caused a lot of businesses to start also taking stronger steps towards labor unions um which 
there's lots of perspectives on the pros and cons of labor unions, especially historically. Um, but that was that was a big deal at the time um, economically. And then he kept interest rates high in the early 80s to continue fighting inflation. That's more of an economics thing. I'm not going to get into it right now, especially now that I'm kind of going on 20 minutes here. But try to keep those interest rates high to fight inflation because that's generally going to be the remedy, which makes things hard. But it's kind of what needs to be done. So this might be a little bit of a misnomer. These are things that happened that generally are seen as being a result of Reagan's policies. Um, it's hard to tell in the grand scheme of things, like what causes what. It's kind of difficult. You have to, you know, you have to kind of make analytical um, conclusions based on what the evidence shows. But in the early 80s, you had a recession, you had a bunch of bank failures, and you had high unemployment. So early on in the 80s, after these policies were instituted, it didn't really look like they were working very well. In fact, they call it the Reagan recession. Um, and there's a variety of reasons why this might have happened that had nothing to do with Reagan's um, policies in particular, mainly that inflation was so high and they had to keep interest rates really high, which usually crimps the economy. Um, but uh, that was going on, so it's not like he just came in and slashed taxes and all of a sudden the world was right again. Um, in the late 80s, there was a long period of recovery in economic growth and lower inflation. So inflation got under control. Um, the economy started to grow, which I'll show you a little bit later. Um, and again, people argue about whether it was more of like a correlation versus a causation. Some people say that because the price of oil finally started to come down and people started to feel like um, inflation was going to go away, that people felt more confident. Um, some people say it was the tax cuts and the deregulation. Um, you have did have, up until recently, really stagnant wages. So wages overall for people, especially in the middle class, have stayed pretty much stagnant up until the last few years or so. Um, and again, you can maybe blame, you can blame this on Reagan's policies potentially. I, I mean, I can see the, the causation there. You, you give a whole bunch, you take away, you know, you change the perspective on unions and you deregulate what businesses can do and how they interact with their workers and you cut taxes more so for people that are uh, high up on the income ladder. I can see how that could lead to stagnant wages and a widening gap between rich and poor. But also, this was the time where globalization is starting to take off and a lot of manufacturing jobs that used to pay really well are going overseas. So there's a couple, there's a lot of things happening at the same time. It's sometimes hard to parse out what causes what, but there, um, those are just some, some theories and some perspectives. Uh, the national debt did triple. One, this is honestly, though, one of the things that people don't realize about Ronald Reagan. They think that he was this conservative that came in and like slashed budgets and and had like huge surpluses. Um, but he didn't actually. He he tripled the national debt. He ran really high deficits. Um, and most of that was because he cut taxes and then increased spending on on defense. But these types of conservative policies were very popular into the 1990s and 2000s and even uh, today. They started going out of style for a, about eight years, um, but uh, they've come back. Um, but you had George H.W. Bush. Bill Clinton was a Democrat but still um, signed into law a lot of conservative policies. George W. Bush, again, another Republican. The Tea Party movement that comes about during Barack Obama's uh, presidency. And then obviously uh, uh, Donald Trump elected as a Republican um, on a fairly conservative economic platform. Um, overall. Um, so here's where we'll kind of just, I'll just show you just briefly, and you can pause and look at this for a while if you want. Just look at some of the economic indicators uh, over time so you can kind of see the effects of these, these economic policies. So in the late 70s, you had pretty high, uh, you had higher than normal unemployment. Normally, a normal unemployment rate is about 5%. Um, so if it's below that, that means your economy is doing pretty well. If it's above that, that means you're probably in a recession. You have a pretty slack labor market. So pretty high going into the late 70s, but they actually get quite a bit higher during the first few years of Reagan's presidency, all the way up to 11% in 1982, at which point you start to see it coming down. So again, um, kind of lining up at the beginning with these tax cuts and some of these economic policies, you don't see the unemployment come right down, but you do over time um, up until... I mean, really the end of his presidency was getting down to 5.3%. Later on, during George H.W. Bush's presidency, you start to get a, another recession. Um, but for, for the most part, unemployment came down during Reagan's presidency. Um, inflation, which is how much prices were rising. I tried to give you a broad spectrum here. So we started in 1974, where inflation was 12.3%, which is really high. If you're not um, 
really in economics, normally we want between like uh, up to 3%. If you get more than 3% inflation, that's usually seen as being a little too high. Um, so you see like really high inflation rates up into the 1980s and even into Reagan's first term, where finally around the time the unemployment starts to drop, you start to see the inflation start to come down as well. Um, and then it spikes up again in 1988, um, right at the end, tail end of um, Reagan's presidency. Budget deficit, um, I just showed from 77. So this is the deficit. Um, this is the debt overall, which is a little bit different than the debt. Actually, it's completely different than the deficit. I don't know why I say it's a little bit different. Um, and then you, this is the debt to GDP ratio, which I'm not going to talk too much about, but you can see as when Reagan comes into office immediately, the debt or the deficit skyrockets and increases, increases, increases until it starts to come down a little bit near the end of his term. Um, but really the last prep, like it, they were high until um, Bill Clinton um, was president. He had the last balanced budget, but the deficit really increased, which again, is I think is one of the big things that people don't realize about Ronald Reagan's presidency. Um, but there, there it is for you. Um, wages, let's talk about the stagnation. So this is um, adjusted for inflation, basically. It's what are average hourly wages. So finally, in 19, in, sorry, in March of last year, um, wages, average hourly wages finally got to the point where they were in 1973. So they have been on a downward trajectory. And when we say stagnant wages, you can see that like between 1980 up until really the late 90s, you have pretty stagnant wages, and then they kind of vacillate a little bit, but still are pretty low. Um, and then they started to actually tick up quite a bit recently. Um, and then this is probably the main one that you want to look at. So if you want to, if you want to look at economic um, policy and its effect on the economy, you want to probably look at gross, real gross domestic product or real GDP. Uh, so this is what we want to probably focus on. Really, is like the rate right here. This is uh, real GDP. This is nominal GDP. Um, don't worry about that. But it tells you kind of what happened too. But you can see that in the 70s, you had this kind of slow grow. Well, <laughs> not slow by today's standards, but slowing economy. And then you had the recession where economic growth was negative um, in 1980. Then you had a little bit of an increase, but then you have this Reagan recession in the early part of his first term. But then when you get into his second term, you start to see the economy kind of take off a little bit in 84, and then still 4.2%. Those are good numbers. Um, just for comparison, the highest, there's been two times in the last uh, 12 years, the economic growth has been 2.9%. Um, that's the highest it was. It was 2.9%, it was I want to say in 2015, the tail end of Barack Obama's um presidency and then it hit 2.9 percent again uh i want to say 2017 so the first year of um president trump's presidency but that's it like 2.9 and that was like exciting um here like we're talking 7.2 that's that's astronomical but um once again you can kind of see the numbers if you want to go back and take a look at them one of the sources or activities i have if you want to look more at it looks at more like historical perspectives primary sources from the time period but it gives you some of this evidence um as well um, post Reagan conservatism, I'll just run through really quickly. Like I said, um, the idea of, of being um, economically, fiscally conservative uh, doesn't die when Ronald Reagan's out of office. It, it, it even in Democrat times, um, still is popular. So NAFTA, 1980, 1994, the North American Free Trade Act uh, opened up free trade between Canada, the U.S., and Mexico. It was recently tweaked. Um, in the USMCA, but uh, the idea of, idea of free trade for the economy, less econo economic regulation, is generally an economic cons economically conservative idea. Um, in 1994, Congress tried to come up with this thing called the Contract with America. It was a Republican-led uh, initiative to adopt a variety of um, conservative policies like a balanced budget, anti-crime, changing welfare, which actually did happen, and new tax cuts. Um, but this is the big one, um, welfare reform. So reforming the various welfare programs that were um, happened during that time or in place at that time. And there it is right there. Um, I won't go into the nitty gritty about what happened to welfare reform, but it changed a bunch of programs that made them trying to get, get it so that fewer people were on the welfare program and also um, shortening the amount of time that people could be on.
the welfare programs. And then the Bush tax cuts in 2000, one of George W. Bush's first acts as president was to cut taxes for Americans, especially the uh, upper class. He's facing recession in 2001. Um, same type of idea happened in, when, in 2007, 2008, when it was clear that the Great Recession was starting. Um, and then President Obama also pursued tax cuts as well, but, but did a little more of the liberal economics of, of uh, increasing government spending. And then most recently, 2016 uh, or 2017, major tax reform in terms of corporate taxation went through in, in President Trump's uh, presidency as well. So just kind of an overview of some of the domestic policies. It's mostly focusing on the economy because I think that's what President Reagan's most known for, um, but how you see this shift towards more conservative policies that still continues to today. So thank you, everybody. I appreciate you listening to this. And uh, take a look at some of those other uh, domestic policy, the one that interests you. We've got the war on drugs. We've got uh, the AIDS crisis in the 1980s, and then also um, the environmental policy. All right. So take care, and uh, we'll talk to you all later.